For many, the period of the late Middle Ages in Europe is a hodgepodge of images and stereotypes. Men in armor riding horses, Byzantine church politics, grinding poverty interspersed with scenes of wealth and feasting, festivals with jesters and knights and all manner of distractions. It's a kaleidoscope of contradictory ideas all mixed together to form a picture of a fractured society wherein the only thing that seemed to be important was the satisfaction of the basest of human desires. Yet, if one looks at the period from the time of Charlemagne to the coming of the great mortality with an eye to see beyond the media tropes, one finds a society and a culture seeking to define itself in the midst of enormous obstacles and challenges. While each of the stereotypes can be found, when placed into a proper context, they become substantially less two-dimensional. This was especially true in the time following the end of the Norman invasions, when the forces that enabled the truncated Carolinian Renaissance were allowed a chance to really establish themselves, leading to changes in the society and culture that would be essential to the coming revolutions of a modern age. Throughout Europe, cities, once targets for pillage by Viking raiders and more ambitious conquering warlords, were given a chance in the relative peace to establish themselves as basis of trade and political power, apart from the feudal system. Merchants and craftsmen, organized in guilds, were able to stabilize trades and produce goods of enduring quality and beauty. Advances in field rotation and agriculture created rising populations that would, in time, feed into the cities and the enterprises located there. Monastic orders would inform the practice of the wider church, often speaking prophetically to its failings and calling it back to its higher and better purpose. Perhaps nothing more fully represents the change in European culture in the period leading up to the plague years than the great universities and traditions of scholasticism that dotted the landscape of Europe. In places like Bologna, Oxford, Paris, Valencia, and Padua, scholarship and learning began to uncover and analyze lost documents and new translations with the goal of once again understanding the knowledge of the long lost but never quite forgotten classical world of Greece and Rome. And even when the plague arrived to ravage Europe, overturning or undermining centuries old ways of thinking about governance, religion, and commerce, many of the universities founded in the 11th and 12th centuries were able to survive and emerge from the crisis mostly intact. More than this though, the curriculum inherited from the ancient scholars of Rome and enhanced with the writings of Greek and Islamic scholars continued, fully infused with a willingness to engage in inquiry and debate. This reality meant that the students of the universities produced, those steeped in medieval understandings of the nature of humanity and the world it occupied, also carried within their inherited intellectual tradition a tool that would enable them to address the questions and issues of a new age that would arise from the wreckage of a plague-ridden landscape. This tool, the scholastic method of dialectic inquiry, would allow them to challenge the inherited wisdom of their day and suggest new ideas that would set the stage for both a new renaissance and eventually an entire revolution. That tool, though, had to be first forged and hardened. In the late Middle Ages, as once old knowledge was newly translated, the process of understanding and assimilating it into a new culture, so very different than the one in which it was created, would bring about that institution so unique to the West. In those universities, the men who became masters of arts would create the tool that would change humanity's understanding of the natural world. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place.
Episode 11, Questioning Aristotle. So here we are, back on our voyage of discovering how humanity learned of its place in the cosmos. I hope you enjoyed exploring the island of time as much as I did, but now it's time to once again get under sail and head out into the deeper waters of our narrative. As we set back out, there are a few introductory remarks to be made, I think. First, this episode will be a bit of a transitional one where we do a lot of setup to understand the context of what is to come. While I will certainly spend some time on the work of various natural philosophers, we need to understand not only what they did, but why they were able to do it. This is a place where I think the larger context of the culture in which their work takes place is very important. Second, there needs to be a bit of a warning as we set out. For many of you, The journey we're about to undertake over the next several episodes, one that will lead us up to and through the scientific revolution, will seem like it should be a familiar one. You might already think that you have maps and charts with good navigational instructions. In narrative terms, you may think that you already know the story, one filled with larger-than-life figures like Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton, and a good versus evil element that defines the players and institutions and their roles profoundly well. It's a story our culture likes to tell, and so it's easy to think that we know it. And to be honest, there was a time when I too shared this narrative. You know the one, with the brave Polish genius who turned the world on its head by placing the sun at the middle and having the earth move? Of a courageous Italian natural philosopher who stood up to an entire church to support that claim with evidence and thus suffered dearly for his termidity to proclaim that truth? The German mathematician who solved the problem of planetary motion with hard work, spectacular insight, and an almost mystical devotion to the seeking of the mind of God? And finally, of course, the English super genius who, with one great work, single-handedly brought together all of physics and sparked a rational movement that would completely change the Western mind. However, as I have studied the maps of the lesser-known but much better-traveled navigators, I've come to learn that this narrative is often incomplete, frequently inaccurate, and in some places, just plain wrong. So as we travel forward, I hope you won't be too surprised when we veer off the course plotted on the maps one finds in the Harbor gift shops. You see, what I've learned is that these maps, they've drawn their coastlines smooth and simple in order to be more understandable, where instead the reality is much more complex, harder to navigate, and infinitely more interesting. Their routes avoid the harder to anticipate currents, the eddies in world where the inexperienced can get trapped, but the seasoned sailor will find an abundance of riches. By now, we're an experienced crew, seasoned by long voyages, and so we'll dare to enter those waters and see what we can discover. Third, some of what we will talk about might become a bit technical. We'll do our best to break things down so as to make them easier to understand, but from time to time, we'll need to refer to some technical language or jargon. Occasionally, we'll have to use the proverbial thousand words as there are no pictures in podcasting. In order to help you through this, there are two things we'll do. When referencing some earlier observation or idea about motion, we'll direct you back to the podcast episode we covered the idea in first, so that if you missed it, you can go back and get caught up. For those who wish to do that before going forward with this episode, you can focus on the non-supplemental pieces in this third series of the show as they contain the narrative up to this point. Also, when diagrams or simulations might help the listener get a better sense of what's being discussed, We'll post them, or at least link to them, on our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. Okay, with those thoughts in place, let's see if we can set the background for what's to come. In doing this, I will be taking a somewhat controversial historical position that the late Middle Ages and the early years following the plague actually mattered when it comes to understanding and anticipating the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. 
Part of the usual narrative here is that the 12th and 13th centuries were, like earlier periods, mired in ignorance and superstition. Even when conditions improved, the medieval mind was so entrenched in ways of thinking that were hostile to learning in general and natural philosophy in particular that there was no way it could possibly produce anything of values in areas outside the limited religious material approved by a hidebound and inflexible church. What I hope to show you in this episode is that this is really far from the case. Instead, it was during these years that the fundamental ideas and institutions arose, often with the support of the Catholic Church, that set the stage for the great advances in natural philosophy, specifically astronomy and physics, in the 16th and 17th century. This is not a new idea, as it dates to the work of physicist and historian of science Pierre Duhem in the 1900s, early 1900s. But it does represent a break from the earlier view expressed most completely by Alexander Koira, that worldviews in these two periods were significantly different. To put this in terms of Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, that older narrative claims that the paradigms of the medieval mind and the early modern scientific mind were what was called incommensurate, or in more common terms, broadly incompatible in terms of the fundamental assumptions about how things worked when trying to understand the natural world. The thinking here is that so different are the worldviews of the Aristotelian 12th century in the Newtonian 17th century, that it's unlikely that one could have organically arisen from the other without some sort of significant break in thinking that not only did not require the work of the late medieval scholars, but that explicitly rejected it. If one, however, considers the historical evidence, I think it becomes pretty clear that while the scientific revolution does represent a profoundly new way of imagining the natural world, that picture was not created out of whole cloth. Rather, it incorporated and extended thinking begun in the institutions of learning that had begun to dot the European landscape before the plague and that proliferated after it. Moreover, it was the tools of inquiry developed during the late Middle Ages that were explicitly built upon by the natural philosophers of the early modern period that led to the scientific revolution. I think the best description of this transition and the essential elements that led to it can be found in the foreword of Edward Grant's book, The Foundation of Modern Science in the Middle Ages, Their Religious, Institutional, and Intellectual Contexts. He writes, quote, Indeed, that revolution would have been inconceivable without the cumulative antecedent efforts of three great civilizations, Greek, Islamic, and Latin. With the scientific riches it derived by translation from Greco-Islamic sources in the 12th and 13th centuries, the Christian Latin civilization of Western Europe began the last leg of the intellectual journey that culminated in a scientific revolution that transformed our world. Four essential factors enabled medieval Europe to prepare the way for the new science of the 17th century. Translations into Latin of Greek and Arabic scientific texts in the 12th and 13th centuries, the development of universities, which were uniquely Western and used the translations as the basis of a science curriculum, the adjustments of Christianity to secular learning, and the transformation of Aristotle's natural philosophy. This study reviews the accomplishments of medieval science and also carefully considers how they looked forward to the scientific revolution." End quote. As we go forward in this episode, I'd like to look at each of these four factors in a bit of detail in order to set the stage for what will happen in the 15th and 16th centuries in the field of astronomy that will once again remove the Earth from the center of the cosmos, something suggested at several points in the history of astronomical thought, but never taken seriously enough to become a threat to replace the dominant geocentric model. So let's take a look at Grant's four points. 
His first factor is the translation of various sources of ancient scientific material into the lingua franca of Europe at this time, Latin. This, of course, began with men such as Gerard of Cremona, as we discussed in our episode, Astronomy Between the Plagues. When Toledo and its vast library fell to Christian forces in the 11th century, the Islamic translations of the works of Greek antiquity and the copies of the works of many of the scholars of the broad Islamic empires, consisting of Arabic, Persian, Jewish, and Christian writers, began to make their way into the European consciousness. This will ignite the intellectual component of the 12th century Renaissance that will finally begin to lift Europe up out of the mire it had been slogging through for about the last 600 years. Vital to this is the second of Grant's factors, the universities. Arising out of the cathedral schools and monastic training facilities, these institutions were, in some ways, the most lasting legacy of Charlemagne's years as Emperor of the Romans. Those early training and theological institutes would soon adopt the old Greco-Roman liberal arts curriculum centered on the trivium and quadrivium, and then add to these master's programs in theology, law, and medicine. And before we move forward here, a brief note is in order. While we will focus in this series on the field of astronomy, one of the subjects of the quadrivium, it should be said that at least as important in this translation and assimilation process we are discussing, if not more so, were the texts on medicine, especially from the authors of the Arabic tradition. These would be of enormous value as universities began to produce physicians and apothecaries over the next four centuries. Unfortunately, we really don't have time, at least at this point, to talk about the cultural and economic forces that gave rise to the universities in any real detail. There are, however, a few things we will note. First, the universities, while arising from the cathedral schools, formed themselves under the guild system prevalent in the urban centers of Europe. This gives them significant economic power due to their ability to boycott, strike, and even leave a city, something that would deprive it of a significant source of revenue. Second, the members of the faculty, while not necessarily active clergy, were afforded clerical status, giving them easier travel and enhanced protections under the law. Most significantly, this exempted them from being tried in civil courts for various offenses against the state something that would lead to a substantial amount of intellectual autonomy, as the church at this time was often much more tolerant of dissenting thought and opinion than the political institutions. As the university system became established, a divide arose. Those faculty teaching the seven subjects of the liberal arts became something of a lesser order to those teaching in the master's programs, especially in the field of theology. That was, at least, until the discovery and translation of the sort of documents that we've been mentioning. Almost all of these fell squarely in the liberal arts curriculum, and so there was a leveling within the university faculties and a rush of talent to understand these new translations. Among the most important of these were the writings of Aristotle, and just as importantly, the various commentaries on his work made by scholars of both the later Greek and Islamic traditions. The former commentators had written in an attempt to explain Aristotle to later Roman readers who were often unfamiliar with the early Greek philosophy, while the latter wrote to synthesize his work with the teachings of Muhammad. Perhaps the most influential of these was an Iberian scholar whose name in Latin was Averroes, or as he was more often called, just simply, the commentator. As part of the early Islamic attempt to synthesize Aristotle's writings, with the religious dictates of the Muslim faith, there was a strong emphasis on including Platonic ideas as a way of softening Aristotle's strongly empirical ideas. Averroes, or Ibn Rushd, as his name was in Arabic, felt that this had corrupted the original intent and meaning of Aristotle's writings. As such, he produced numerous commentaries aimed at correcting this. Even when later translations of Aristotle from the original Greek were made, often resulting in a more accurate text due to the structural and grammatical similarities between Greek and Latin. The commentaries of Averroes were still of great value in attempting to understand what Aristotle was saying. 
especially as Aristotle had this tendency to become rather vague on topics he hadn't quite worked out completely. Once the Aristotelian corpus is accepted into the university curriculum, a process we'll describe here in a few moments, there is a radical shift in the way things are both constructed and structured in terms of a student's progress through the curriculum. The first change is a new emphasis in the subject matter. Prior to the new translations, the quadrivium, subjects organized around the central role of mathematics, were often only given a cursory coverage due to the paucity of source material on which to base teaching. Thus, students would usually come for just two years to get a firm grounding in the subjects of the trivium and something of an exposure to the quadrivium before leaving the university to take up posts in civil service or administration in the church. As the works of Aristotle, Galen, Euclid, and the Islamic Hakim and scholars come into the curriculum, there's a massive expansion of the material available for teaching in the higher level subjects. By the 12th and 13th centuries, this inclusion is so well established that the Master of Arts, once the weakest and least rigorous of the master's degrees, is now split into three strong and broad subject areas, ethics, metaphysics, and for the first time as a separate subject, natural philosophy. Now this is where things start to get really interesting. For some time, the Christian theology had been most closely aligned with Greek thinking along the lines of Plato. Plato's strong rationalism and theory of forms fit well with the theological doctrines of a heaven where the flaws of this world were perfected in the light of an all-knowing and all-powerful designer. The idea of a fashioner who was driven by the dual imperatives of function and aesthetics put forward by the great Greek philosopher could easily be identified as the Judeo-Christian God with only minor modification. And so it's easy to see the strong influence of Neoplatonism in the theological positions of the early church, something that still undergirded Roman Catholicism in the West and Orthodoxy in the East at this time. However, as the works of Aristotle began to become known again, at least in the West, because they were never really lost in the Byzantine East, there arose a problem. Aristotle disagreed with his teacher on a whole host of things, including topics such as any form of atomism, the superiority of rationalism as a way to understand the natural world, the experience of a perfect realm of forms, and a description of how and why things moved. The most disturbing of Aristotle's positions, however, was his assertion that the physical universe was eternal, something that flew in direct opposition to the creation narrative of Christianity, not to mention its eschatological theology, or, to put it more simply, the story of how the natural universe would come to an end. Thus, even as these works were making their way into the universities and becoming the subject of intense study and debate, the forces within the church were suspicious of their content and, from time to time, and in a limited number of places, moved to outlaw their use and study. This leads us to Grant's third part of the process of laying the foundation for science in the late Middle Ages, the adjustment of Christianity to secular teaching. Key to this movement was an intellectual tradition known as scholasticism. Formally, Scholasticism is known as a historical movement within the medieval universities, wherein its adherents practiced a form of scholarship centered on the use of what is known as a logical dialectic process. Less formally, scholasticism represents the return of inquiry as a central part of the intellectual process. Let me see if I can explain. Early in the history of these schools and universities, their role was mainly the transmission of received knowledge from one generation to the next. This was done through simple lecture, where the text of a document was read out to the students gathered to hear a lecturer. The student would take whatever notes they wished, something that could run from being something like a loose paraphrase of the text to an attempt to make a word-for-word -word copy. At the end of the lecture, the Master of Arts teaching the course might make just a few additional comments regarding the work drawing either from whatever commentary tradition might exist and or his own thoughts on the matter. However, as the new translations came into the academic circles of Europe, they had to be assimilated, and to do that, the lecture wasn't going to be a good thing to use. 
Now this is as good a time as any to address a myth or misconception that's always sort of out there in discussions of these matters. And that myth or misconception is that Christianity was hostile and reactionary to the introduction of any new knowledge and information. This is a view that was originally put forward by the Enlightenment writers, especially those associated with the French Revolution and what followed it, that had as a specific aim the discrediting of a church that they saw, perhaps rightly, as bloated and corrupt, at least in the Ancien Regime of France. However, when one examines the historical evidence, it turns out that the case for this position is actually pretty weak. While there are certainly instances of reactionary response to new knowledge, especially following the Protestant Reformation, on the whole, the tradition of Christianity from its founding is one of accommodation and synthesis with non-religious thought of the time. Again, we don't have time to delve into this topic in any re real detail, but when one looks at the slow growth of Christianity in the Roman Empire, especially when compared to the extraordinarily rapid expansion of Islam in the 7th and 8th centuries, it becomes clear that Christianity, on the whole, was able to incorporate the ideas of Greek and Roman philosophy into its theological positions as time went on, something it continued to do as the empire fell and it was forced to find a footing in a post-Roman Germanic world. When the ideas of Aristotle once again become available to the European mind in the 12th and 13th centuries, there was another movement to determine how to take in these secular ideas so that they were amenable to the religious worldview of the church while setting aside those that did not. While this process was not without its bumps, it eventually did take place with the blessing of the church. In fact, many of the points of contention we will encounter later in our story will be established as a matter of doctrine or even dogma during this period and will be contested later on. And so this is where that second thing becomes so important. As this new information enters the university, the methods of instruction have to expand in order to deal with it. Beyond the simple lectures, there were added what are now known as disputations. These sessions were attended by students and led by a master who would pose a question. This question would then be debated by the more senior students of the master. If you were an early student, you just sat there and kept quiet and tried to learn something. And some of these would take one position while others would take in another that was in some sense oppositional to the first. As the debate wound to a conclusion, the master would summarize the positions, including the strengths and weaknesses, then assess the strengths of the arguments, and finally pronounce an outcome, whether that be the superiority of one position over another or the need to probe the subject more deeply. This dialectic practice became what is known as scholasticism and took a curriculum that had been built around the paradigm of mere knowledge transmission to one of inquiry. As I hope you recognize, this will become a foundational element to the development of a science that is a method of inquiry. This process was especially emphasized at the University of Paris and even more so at the University of Oxford, where a number of scholars would build on the work of Ibn al-Hatham and Ibn Sina, or in Latin, Avicenna, to create the first European expressions of a process of scientific inquiry and discovery. These men, solidly trained within the scholastic tradition, would include Robert Grossetest, Roger Bacon, and William of Ockham, all of whom would make substantial contributions to developing a methodological approach to natural philosophy built on observation and experimentation to test the predictions made by hypotheses. Returning to the process of assimilation of the newly translated material, this process was not without its bumps. In Paris, the bishop of the city outlawed the use of the Aristotelian texts until a true synthesis could be arrived at, and no man was more influential in doing this than one Thomas Aquinas. The reason the conflict and resolution occurred at the University of Paris is that it possessed the greatest school and faculty of theology in Europe at the time. While the Italian universities were known for their expertise in law and medicine, and the English institutions were highly regarded in natural philosophy, Paris, in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, 
excelled at producing scholars of theology. Throughout the 1200s, there were a series of successive bans or warnings against the teaching of the works of Aristotle or his commentators, especially Averroes. But these were broadly ineffective for a couple of reasons. First, they didn't seem to have been very well enforced, at least early on, likely due to the church's continuing internal divisions and involvement in external political affairs. Second, the bans were often very local in nature, confined to just the University of Paris. As such, other institutions such as Oxford, Cambridge, and Toulouse would attract students and faculty away for a time as they were under no such edict against the inclusion of Aristotle's work in their curriculum, something that undoubtedly influenced Oxford's rise as a center of the study of natural philosophy prior to the Great Plague. By the 1270s, the situation had reached a point where forbidding the inclusion of Aristotle in the curriculum was just unworkable, and so the Diocese of Paris attempted to determine which topics would need to be excluded and which ones could be included. In 1277, a list of 219 forbidden articles or topics was published that included some of Aristotle's work in natural philosophy. While this list signaled the end of the use of the works in the lecture portion of the curriculum at French universities, it did not stop the faculty and students from discussing them in disputations or private conversations, especially among the arts faculty, who did not feel that theological issues should impinge on their subject matter. And this fed into a broader struggle that had arisen between the arts and theology faculty in general. And this, of course, was something that wasn't just confined merely to Paris. While the struggles among faculty at modern universities today may seem contentious, they really don't hold a candle to what was taking place in the, in the 13th century. While some faculty in the liberal arts today complain of the ascendancy of the disciplines associated with the sciences, it's basically still broadly held that the faculty across the academy generally hold each other in roughly equivalent levels of esteem. Such was not the case in the 1200s. At that time, the faculty in many universities was engaged in a fairly harsh debate as to whether the arts faculty should be treated as equals with the theology faculty. This reflected a broader question within Christianity itself. A long-running dispute in the West was whether the route to a true knowledge of the divine was through reason or revelation. The first was represented by philosophy in all its forms, while the second was represented by theology. Since the time of Athanasius in the 4th century, and he claimed that faith was the only true path to knowing God, theology had been ascendant. However, there were ample writings in the tradition of the church, most notably those of Augustine, that attested to the place of reason. In the second half of the 13th century, this debate flared up in the discourse among the faculty of the universities. While the full story of this is complicated, the greatest voice in favor of the ascendancy of revelation in theology was a brilliant scholar by the name of Bonaventure. He argued that all the subjects of the academy were the handmaidens of theology, and thus subordinate to it. The other great voice in this conversation was Thomas Aquinas, theologian and philosopher. He argued that philosophy in general, and natural philosophy in particular, was an equally valid path to knowledge of the divine, and those who thought to understand the natural world were also engaged in the holy endeavor of coming to a deeper knowledge of God, as it was thought that the creation, even though corrupted by sin, must reflect the Creator. Now, it's tempting to set this up as some sort of great academic, theological, philosophical boxing match, with Bonaventure in one corner and Aquinas in the other, but that would really be overstating things quite a bit. Bonaventure acknowledged the role of natural philosophy in his writings, while Aquinas recognized a special place for theology. What was being debated here was a matter of emphasis. Both men wrote on matters of theology and natural philosophy, referencing the work of Aristotle extensively, and both wrote against those aspects of Aristotelianism that contradicted the articles of faith of the Catholic Church. Aquinas, however, emphasized that reason and natural philosophy were the primary tools the scholar should use to understand the natural world, thus emphasizing an independence of philosophy from theology that Bonaventure found unwarranted. 
Interestingly, the two men's lives often intertwine, with both studying at the University of Paris and writing commentaries on the same works, and both being largely responsible for directing their monastic orders, the Dominicans in Aquinas' case and the Franciscans in Bonaventure's, towards moderate paths that kept them within the Catholic Church's mainstream while still allowing them to practice a rule that kept them distinct and able to inform the Church when needed. Both men died in the same year, 1274, just prior to a monumental event in the world of scholasticism. As introduced previously, in 1277, the Bishop of Paris, Etienne Tempierre, issued a list of 219 propositions that were not to be taught by the faculty at the university there. This followed a shorter list that had been issued about seven years earlier. Known as the Condemnations of 1270 and 1277, they were an attempt to rein in the teachings of certain members of the faculty who were known as radical Averroists for their willingness to entertain certain notions of Aristotle's teachings based on the commentary of Averroes. While there are a number of elements that we could look at here, I would like to focus on just a few of the more important ones in order to give a sense of the discourse and the setup for what is to come. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest issue seems to have been the assertion by Aristotle that the natural universe had to be eternal. In his works, On the Heavens, he states, quote, The world as a whole was not generated and cannot be destroyed, as some allege, but is unique and eternal, having no beginning or end of its whole life. End quote. So threatening was the statement that there were 27 different arguments made against it. So why so many? Especially since there wasn't really a big push in the culture to consider the idea. Well, there are two reasons, I think. The first is that the topic made for an easy whipping post. Since no one of any authority was going to challenge someone who made an argument against Aristotle on this topic, or really even challenge an argument that sort of has a set of basic assumptions that could be suspect, it was easy to curry favor by showing how Aristotle had to be wrong, even if the argument was weak. The second, and this one is much more consequential, is that there were those in the scholastic community who began to take a critical look at the problem using the scholastic dialectic process and came to the conclusion that perhaps it wasn't so cut and dry as it seemed. The two figures that were best known for this were Bothius of Dacia and Segur of Brabant, each of whom wrote a work addressing the eternity of the natural universe. Bothius argued that no philosopher at least on the grounds of natural philosophy, could argue that a first motion had to have come into being. As such, he said, one could not argue that the universe would have a specific beginning and thus, due to this lack of evidence, it was possible that the universe was eternal. Given that there could be no proof determined from the application of reason or evidence for either position, both must be admitted as possibilities. However, as there can be no contradiction between faith and reason, he says that faith must, in the end, carry the argument. In his words, quote, The world is not eternal, but was created anew, although this cannot be demonstrated by arguments, just as may be said about other things that pertain to the faith. For if they could be demonstrated, they would not belong to the faith, but to science. There are many things in the faith which cannot be demonstrated by reason, as, for example, that a dead person comes to life, again numerically, the same as he is now, and that a generable thing returns without generation. And he who does not believe these things is a heretic, and whoever seeks to know these things by reason is a fool." Unquote. Yet, even in this capitulation to the primacy of faith, Bothius still makes certain claims that are extraordinarily controversial. The biggest of these is that, is that Aristotle's prime matter, the stuff out of which all matter, both terrestrial and celestial, must be made, and thus must be eternally coexistent with God, 
even as it was created by God. Both of these positions were also expressed and elaborated on by Segur. This sort of walking the fine line between affirming the truth of Aristotle and affirming the confession of faith was worrisome enough to the conservative members of the faculty and the ecclesial authorities that it was argued against vociferously. With the issuance of the condemnations of 1277, both men would flee France for Italy, where the edicts of Paris's bishop had no force. Interestingly, though, Aquinas would, during his second tenure at the University of Paris in the decade before the issuances of the condemnations, break with his more con conservative colleagues on the faculty in Paris and confirm the logic of Bothius' argument for the possibility of an eternal world, even as he too affirmed his commitment to the theological position of a universe created by God. In this, we see a trend that would become very prevalent among the faculty of natural philosophy following the issuances of these two condemnations, something called the doctrine of the double truth. Here, the scholar, if he reached conclusions through the philosophical application of reason that might be seen as to contradict church teaching or that might support one of those 219 condemned propositions, he would hold that the proposition was allowed by the dictates of natural philosophy even as it was rendered false by the dictates of faith. In the words of historian Albert Maurer, quote, For there to be two contradictory truths, the Christian truth that the world is not eternal would have been opposed to a philosophical truth that the world is eternal. But we look in vain in Bothius's treatise for the statement that the eternity of the world is philosophically true. We are told that it simply follows from the principles of natural philosophy. In one place, Bothius asserts that it follows from the, quote, truths of natural causes, unquote but the conclusion itself is not explicitly said to be true. Bothius comes cl so close to affirming the twofold truth at this point, and yet avoids it so adroitly, that we can only conclude that he did so deliberately. Like Segur of Babrant, he appears to be very careful not to bring faith and philosophy into open contradiction in the realm of truth. And yet he comes so close that we can see why he was condemned by the Bishop of Paris." End quote. For the more astute listeners in the audience, one might see some strong correlation to some of the conversations between faith and science today. Then, as is sometimes the case even now, what is held to be true based on natural reasoning that can allow nothing but natural causes is overturned by the imposition or allowance of some sort of supernatural cause. Perhaps it is true that in the realms of philosophy, natural or otherwise, there really is nothing new under the sun. One of the other places this sort of thing becomes commonplace is in the question of God's power and its possible limitation. One of the things that Aristotle's physics explicitly denied was the possibility of the existence of a vacuum, for reasons we'll discuss shortly. This, of course, in the late Middle Ages, was seen as a limitation on God's power, something that was unacceptable. Several of the 219 articles addressed this particular issue, and thus, much of Aristotle's work on motion was placed off-limits to teaching in the University of France. Or were they? While the theology faculty certainly avoided the topics, the arts faculty, especially those teaching in the areas of natural philosophy at the master's level, found a way around the restrictions. When asserting the possibility of one of the articles that had been condemned, the writer would claim to be quote unquote speaking naturally as a way to suggest that the arguments being made were only thought to be the hypothetical and thus not abridging the dictate to not discuss things that contradicted the faith. This formulation freed the author or speaker to consider only natural arguments without having to take into account the theological implications of what was being proposed. What is interesting about this is that it actually ended up sort of cutting both ways. While it was certainly used to circumvent the condemnations, 
It was also used when a scholar wished to assert a position that called into question one of Aristotle's conclusions. As we've discussed in some of the early episodes on our Adam series, the stature of Aristotle in the late Middle Ages was such that for those propositions and positions he took that were accepted by the church, there was a universal acceptance that accorded them a near doctrinal legitimacy. Thus, especially after the publication of Aquinas' Summa Theologica and then his canonization in 1323, questioning Aristotle's conclusions was tantamount to questioning the received wisdom of the church in many cases. Therefore, to be able to use a doctrine of two truths formulation, or to be able to speak naturally as it was called, when arguing against some conclusion of Aristotle's was just as important. And this had the unintended consequences of encouraging speculation on the quote-unquote natural impossibilities of the Aristotelian worldview. If the church claimed that Aristotle's assertion that there could be no vacuum was false, as such a thing would be limiting the power of God, why couldn't some of Aristotle's other claims about the natural world, ones not opposed by the church, be wrong as well? In fact, the specific discussion about the possibility that God might create a vacuum, or more generally a void, spurred a good bit of speculation about what the motion of a body might be in such a case. This, in turn, brought about a much larger and more thorough conversation about Aristotle's description of motion, and it is to this that we will turn to conclude our episode. As you will recall from an episode earlier in the series, Aristotle had divided the universe into two realms, the terrestrial and the celestial, or sublunary and superlunary in later terms, alluding to the place of the lower terrestrial realm as being within the sphere of the moon. In Aristotle's cosmology, the substance and motion of objects in these two regions was significantly different. In the celestial realm, all objects were composed of an element known as either quintessence or fifth element or ether, and thus it was said that they had to move in a naturally circular motion. In the terrestrial realm, however, Objects were made of combinations of the four traditional elements, earth, water, air, and fire, and could move in two different ways. The first of these ways was known as natural motion, and it was either up or down as an object sought to find its proper place in creation. Earth fell while fire rose with water and air assuming positions in between. An object would move naturally according to which element was more predominant in the mixture. The rate of motion or velocity would be determined by how much of the predominant element there was, as well as the density of the medium through which the object traveled. It is here that Aristotle will specifically argue against the existence of, of a void, as such a thing would allow for an infinitely large velocity, something he found untenable. The other type of motion was known as violent motion and it occurred when an object was made to move in some way other than straight up or straight down natural motion, such as would be the case for an arrow flying through the air after being fired from a bow or an object pushed along a tabletop. For this type of motion, Aristotle said that the velocity of the object would be directly proportional to the force F impressed upon it and inversely proportional to the total resistance R opposing the motion of the body something that Aristotle said was a combination of some internal property of the body to resist motion and the properties of the medium it was traveling through. If one were to express this mathematically, something that you could do at this point in time because of the Arabic or Islamic invention of algebra, the velocity v would be proportional to f divided by r. So if one wished to double the velocity of the object in this model, one could either double the applied force or reduce the resistance by half. While this certainly seems plausible for an object being continuously pushed across a tabletop, a question arose as to the flight of an arrow. What exactly impressed the force on the arrow after it left the bow? Aristotle's answer, one that even he acknowledged as being rather unsatisfactory, was to say that as the arrow pushed the air out of the way, the air that filled in behind it would exert some sort of a continuing force on the back of the arrow that kept it moving. 
So with this picture in place, what is it that the scholastic natural philosophers of the 13th and 14th century do in their speculation? The first group of this time to question Aristotle's account of violent motion was a group of natural philosophers at Oxford, where, as you will recall, the condemnations of Paris had not been in effect. As such, the natural philosophers among the arts faculty there were more used to open discourse, both on the merits and weaknesses of the Aristotelian worldview. These men, known as the Oxford Calculators, are known for a variety of contributions during this era including what is known as the mean value theorem, which until the recent discovery of Mesopotamian tables that use this method, it was thought that they had actually invented. One of their number, Thomas Bardwardine, pointed out a problem in Aristotle's formulation in a proposal for disputation in 1328. One of the problems with Aristotle's formulation was that according to the relationship he put forward, any amount of impressed force should cause an object to move with some constant velocity. However, as anyone who has ever tried to push a particularly heavy piece of furniture across the floor knows, if you don't push above a certain amount, the furniture just doesn't go anywhere. Now Aristotle understood this, and so he thought to explain this by saying that if the impressed force F was less than the resistance R, the object wouldn't have any velocity. And of course, that's actually not what the formula says. Bardwardine pointed out that this solution created an arbitrary discontinuity and thus broke the connection between the physical system and its mathematical model in a way that seemed to make no sense. As a solution to this, Bardwardine proposed a geometrical mathematical relationship to replace that of Aristotle's that came to be known as a ratio of ratios. In his new formulation of the equation or law of motion, he said that to have the velocity, you had to take the square root of the ratio of f over r. If one wished to make the velocity one third of its original value, one would take the cube root of that ratio. This would avoid the problem of ever having a physical situation where the force was less than the resistance. Now, this wasn't the only issue that came up with Aristotle's terrestrial physics. As early as the 6th century CE, a Greek commentator, John Philoponus, had raised questions about the role the medium through which an object traveled played in determining the object's motion. Of course, scholars in Europe wouldn't know about this commentary until the translation movement of the 12th and 13th centuries. Philoponus challenged both the idea that the medium had to exert a resistive action on the body and, more importantly, Aristotle's assertion that it was the medium's filling in behind an object that provided the continuing force in violent motion. He suggested instead that there was a continuing incorporeal force that was impressed on the object even after it left the interaction with the pushing agent. Islamic scholars familiar with the work of Philipponus would build upon his objections. The most significant of these was a scholar by the name of Ibn Bajah who was known in Europe by his Latinized name, Avenpace. He was a resident of Andalusia in the 12th century, and he questioned the role of the medium through which an object traveled, not in this case for violent motion, but instead for the natural motion of a falling body. Aristotle had claimed that the time for an object to fall from a given height was directly proportional to the resistance of the medium through which the object fell something that's completely reasonable if one observes dropping a coin through air as opposed to dropping it through water. Avenpaste argued that this could only be true if the time for an object to travel from one point to another only depended on the resistance of the medium. However, Avenpaste pointed out that in the celestial realm, the ether was claimed to have no resistance, otherwise the motions of the heavenly bodies would come to a stop. If Aristotle's claim were true then, the heavenly body should require no time to travel between points and thus move instantaneously, something they obviously didn't do. Given that the planets moved with different speeds through the sky and they were moving through the same medium, i.e. the ether, Avampace was able to assert 
that not only was the resistance of the medium unessential to determine the rate of motion of a body, but also that the sole function of a medium in the terrestrial realm would be to resist motion as opposed to being the cause of that motion's continuation. Thus claimed Avon Pace, if a body was dropped in an environment that lacked a medium, i.e. a void, it would fall with a maximum natural speed as opposed to the infinite speed Aristotle suggested it would and that that would only be reduced by the presence of an intervening medium. This argument, transmitted to the universities of Europe through the commentaries of Averroes, was a powerful rebuttal to parts of Aristotle's picture of motion, especially in the terrestrial realm. While Avonpace, or at least Averroes, by including Avonpace's work in his commentaries, never suggested how a natural philosopher might make measurements of these motions, they did enter into the scholastic dialogue and were included in works by Aquinas on the subject of terrestrial motion. Bardwardine and his fellow Oxford calculators would build on this argument to reconsider natural motion in order to bring it into the picture of motion associated with violent motion. If objects fell or rose naturally, why wouldn't they, too, follow the velocity as proportional to force over resistance relationship? The answer of the calculators was that naturally moving objects do follow this relationship, but that Aristotle's explanation of what caused the motion had to be changed. If you will recall, Aristotle said that the predominant element determined the direction of motion and that the speed was determined by the resistance of the medium. Since that was now called into question, Bardwardine and others said that what was needed was a new way to calculate the forces that led to the motion as well as the resistance that opposed it. They suggested that what was needed was a ratio of the downward elements of earth and water to the upward elements of air and fire. By taking this ratio and using it in the same way as was done in the violent motion case, one could calculate the resulting velocity for an object that fell or rose, even in a vacuum. Moreover, it could be shown that objects with different weights would fall with the same velocity if they were made of the same ratio of heavy versus light elements. Therefore, a 10-pound projectile made of some type of rock would fall with the same velocity as a 20-pound projectile made of that same type of rock, a conclusion that was in opposition to what Aristotle had said. While this has a long way to go to get to what is known as the law of falling bodies, it clearly prefigures the work of Galileo in the 16th century. One final area of motion we will discuss is that of trying to understand why the impressed force continued in the case of violent motion. A number of ideas were put forward by scholastic natural philosophers, but the most promising of these was an idea that built on that suggestion first made by Philipponus and then expanded upon by Avicenna, and it's something that's sometimes called impetus. The best foreign version of this idea was given by John Buridan, a 14th century French priest who taught at the University of Paris, and he conceived of impetus as a motive force transmitted to a moving object by initial contact with the initial mover. The speed of the object after release and the amount of matter the object had were taken as the measures of strength of the impetus that moved the body. This impetus would continue to create the body's motion unless the resistance of the medium through which the body moved diminished it. Listeners who have taken some physics might recall that this definition of impetus bears more than a passing resemblance to the idea of momentum Newton will use in his formulation of physics in the 17th century. Buridan would apply this idea to both violent motion and to natural motion introducing for the first time the term gravitas to describe a body's heaviness. While he seems to have never combined the two in order to produce projectile motion, he does seem to have been the first to consider accelerated motion by looking at increasing increments of impetus. It was also during this time that the Oxford calculators began to develop both the philosophical and mathematical frameworks to treat acceleration as the variation of intensity of motion an important step in moving away from Aristotle's insistence on motion always being constant. As part of this effort, the first definitions of instantaneous velocity would be developed. 
One of the important figures in the development of these ideas outside of Oxford was Nicola Aresme, whose work would span the years of the plague and who would go on to become the Bishop of Lisieux. As we will discuss in the next episode, as important as this work was, it paled in comparison to his argument that Aristotle's objections to a moving earth were in fact unfounded. As can be seen, it is clear that not only were a number of Aristotle's ideas related to motion substantially challenged during the 13th and 14th centuries, but the alternative explanations that were developed would become essential pieces of the work of natural philosophers following the plague years. More than that, though, is the development of a process and culture of inquiry that would make it not only possible, but mandatory for the scholars of the time to subject their ideas, as well as those of others, to scrutiny and debate. This, combined with the methodologies developed by Grossetest and Bacon, would set the stage for a revolution once the conditions were right. The force that would set in motion the circumstances that would create those conditions was, at the very time the Oxford calculators were considering motion, Buridan was proposing impetus, and Bacon was writing about how to do science, emerging from the rodent populations of the Asian steppes. As always, thanks for listening to the show. If you haven't already done so, take a moment to subscribe to us in either iTunes, Google Play Music, or through whatever service you use. This will ensure that when we release new episodes, you'll get them right away. Also, while you're there, won't you consider leaving us a strong review? It really helps us to get the word out. Also, if you enjoy the music we use on the podcast, take a minute to head over to session.blue and listen to the other compositions of the Blue Dot Sessions. I think you'll find they're really fantastic and they create just a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere if you're doing some work in the office or around home. Next week, we'll look at the developments in astronomy both before and after the plague that will lead to a revolution of the spheres. Until then, full sails on your journey.